What does it mean to age well? What does it mean to biohack menopause or hack our age? And why does that have to sound so aggressive, right? But it is the way of our society right now. We're thinking, okay, we've seen over the last 50 years, maybe, maybe more, maybe less, that um, health isn't looking too healthy. And the individual, what I've seen is the individual empowered to take control over their health. There has been a lot of misinformation and a lot of, I would say, corruption within our medical system, pharmaceutical system, insurance systems that really have disempowered so many people or have forced them to rely on outside sources versus inside sources. One thing is part of my journey around the world in 2006 and 2007, and I've continued to travel this summer, you know, my trip to the Camino de Santiago along the Portuguese coastal route and meeting people of all ages and vitality levels and sizes. And it was just a beautiful, inspiring experience as well as going to India and talking with sages, gurus, you know, wisest among us. And I really have enjoyed and learned so much from travel around the world. When I wrote my book, Menu Pause, it has recipes from around the world. Like what have other cultures done that have existed long before American cultures and optimizing their health, their hormones, the way they're aging? How are they eating? How are they moving? What are some medicinal foods that are incorporated into their diet and their lifestyle? One of the reasons I created Mighty Maca Plus was because of my journey around the world and learning about these superfoods and how it improved and impacted my health in a powerful way when my doctor's bag was empty. I continue to learn from the wisdom of other cultures and within our own culture, what is the leading scientific tips, wisdom, proven methods that really do support our health and longevity. So on today's Girlfriend Doctor podcast, I am bringing a guest in who is um, I met during one of my travels this summer. I met her in England. And she was just lovely. She was introduced to me by one of our colleagues. And I was fascinated by her because she is a nomad, a digital nomad. Both her and her husband travel continuously. And uh, when it was a coincidence that we were in London at the same time. So we got to sit and break fast and connect. And she is a known, known as a gerontologist. She studied gerontology at uh, the University of Southern California and earned her master's degree in this and has really focused on helping the women during the challenging times of menopause really get rid of the ageist stereotypes. And she's a living proof of it. She is also the dynamic host of Hack My Age podcast, and she focuses on empowering women navigating the menopausal transition through biohacking techniques. So I look forward to introducing Zora to you today. So welcome, Zora Benhamu. Welcome, Zora, to the Girlfriend Doctor podcast. So where in the world are you? Today I'm in Spain. I'm a nomad, so it's hard to pin me down, but I'm just in the very South. So it's it's actually a beautiful day. Well, I am excited to hear what your journeys and what your travels have been like since I met you in June. I think it was early June, end of June, early June. I don't know, sometime yeah. in June in London. Yeah. Where have you been traveling? And you've been doing interviews with women uh, about their menopause experience around the world. So I'd love for you to talk about that. <laughs> Yes, I've since London, I've been to Warsaw, I've been to Prague, and um, and I'm thinking where else I've been, but those are the two main places where I really hit some some great interviews. And I found the very, very surprisingly different uh, challenges, I think, in those countries and in other countries. I've been to Asia, I've been to have interviews, women in Thailand and Vietnam with no problem, in Spain, France. London as well. 
And in Prague in particular, and the, the further east I go in Europe, I find the women are much more reserved, do not want to talk to a stranger on the street who literally stops them and says, hey, would you answer five questions about menopause? And most of the time I would, if the woman doesn't want to answer, she's a little shy. It's, oh, I'm, I'm shy. It's okay. No. Or they'll say it was really bad. And I really don't want to share. And I'm like, that's exactly what I want to hear. Right. But these women in Prague, particularly, they looked at me as if I really offended them and they were like, no, and get out of my store kind of an attitude. And I was, I was, had one and then I had the next and I had, a th- had all this rejection and I do get a lot of rejection, but not that much. And I stopped some local younger Czech women. I said, what's going on? You know, I, 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 am I saying something wrong? And they said, well, one, uh, Czech women are very closed. We don't like to talk in general, especially to strangers. And yes, you, they are feeling maybe it's that you're saying, Hey, you look old. Let mm-hmm. me ask you some questions because there's this stigma still and this association with old aging. And obviously that just shows their ageist stereotypes. And in gerontology, we learned a lot about ageism being the worst ism of all of the isms because it's socially accepted. And here they are uh, uh, being a little bit more ageist to their own selves. So I found it really hard to open them up. I did find some women, but I did have a lot of challenges there. And I thought, when I went to Asia, I was like, oh, that, you know, women may be a bit more shy. They don't want to be open. No, no, no. Especially the Thai, the Vietnamese. Let's talk about my libido. Let's talk about my sex life. And I was like, oh, on camera to a stranger? <laughs> Are you serious? And I, that really surprised me. It was very easy, uh, particularly in Thailand, to, to get some interviews. So what were you finding? Well, first of all, define gerontology. So you're a gerontologist. Yes. A lot of thank you for asking because a lot of people don't know what that is and they think it's a geriatric physician. It's not. I study aging. I study longevity. And we look at the whole life course from birth until death to try to understand why people are aging, why we're getting certain diseases, how we're aging at the pace of aging. We, of course, we look at older adults and social policy. We try to advocate them, but we're not looking at just the biological aspect as perhaps a doctor maybe would. We look at the, the psychological aspects, the sociological aspects to aging to try to tease out all of these this, this information and make some conclusions if we can at all. Does that and make sense? And also when you describe yourself as a digital nomad, what does that mean? <laughs> so a nomad, a, a digital nomad is somebody who uh, earns their living online. So I have a podcast. I'm a host of the Hack My Age podcast. I have. I just need my computer, my microphone, some Wi-Fi, and I'm good to go. And when you're a nomad, it means you don't have a home. You just live out of a suitcase. And we travel from my husband and I, which the two of us. Now, when we came, became empty, empty nesters, we decided to sell the home, sell the car, sell the things. You don't need very much. And we said, let's just travel. And I loved, I love traveling. And I love uh, talking to people of all different cultures and trying to figure out, of, again, all about aging and menopause see what they're doing differently, what are their attitudes like, and, and what can we learn from them? So that's what a digital nomad is. It's just carry my stuff around my suitcase and <laughs> make my that's money online. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, I had um, way back in 2006, 2007, taken a sabbatical from my clinic and just traveled around the world with uh, a man, my daughters, Amanda and Amira, were seven and 10 at the time and homeschooled them along the way and just immersing into cultures. My mom would always say travel is one of your best educations. It exactly. really is. It really is learn the language, live among the people and prejudices will fall away. So I'm interesting as you know, part of my, when I wrote my book, Menu Pause, it was incorporating foods that really supported menopause around the world that were indigenous to the cultures that I interviewed. And so what are you finding? What are like, what, when the Czech woman opened up, what did they say? Like, you know, what was their experience? So the, the concept of um, aging, like, and we talk about being ageist or ageism, the, that it's not, it's not something to be proud of. Where in the world is aging something to be proud of, honored, revered, in an empowering stage? I'm not moving well, there. Probably, <laughs> yes. It's, it's more in the Eastern cultures. In Japan, particularly, they're more revered. 
And, but there's an interesting study that was done that looked at, I don't remember how many countries, maybe 60 more or less around the world. And they concluded that everyone's ageist to some degree. And so it's just that in the East, it's, they're a little bit less ageist. It's a little bit easier to integrate older adults into society. Whereas in the West, we tend to shove them away in a nursing home or we, they don't, they were fire them from their jobs when in fact they could be very valuable, maybe in a different position, or we just don't want to look at the older adults because of our own ages thoughts. And, and we can change that too. And that, that should be changed because it'll save us a lot of money actually in the, the system in, and all, all of the system. So I think it's in, in a lot of ways, not just the money, but it's also people will be healthier and happier as well. So in, in the more Eastern cultures is a little bit more, more accepted. And, and you do see older adults it, it, it integrate in just the fabric of society much more than I say in, in Western cultures. Yeah. And so are there any like tips that you've learned along the way that have been helpful in hacking or in improving the menopause transition? And and I want to hear about your menopause transition. I've been doing a series called Celebrating Menopause. So I really do want to celebrate. Like that's one of the reasons I walked the Camino de Santiago was to celebrate this transition time period in my life and, um, and to dig deep into the transformation that yeah. happens during this time of life. So, so I'm curious with your worldly yeah. experience, what, you know, what it's been like for you and, and why you really dug into it. So we'll break this in two parts. I'll talk about my experience and after, but I think it's interesting to see the attitudes of women around the world and how they are handling their menopause, what they think about menopause. And what I've been finding, and when I interview women, I, 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 have all different kind of socioeconomic levels as well. I mean, I stop a, a, a fruit vendor on the street, or I'll speak to a doctor in an office, and they have. Um, it'll be interesting to see their their points of view. But I noticed a lot when I was in Asia, particularly. I found, uh, and I'm talking mostly about Thailand and Vietnam, which where I really banged out a lot of these reels, these these interviews, and I found that they kind of looked at me when I was asking them questions. They were like, "Okay, I'll talk about menopause, but." like why like like it, it's not that important kind of a thing they do have the same symptoms as we do it's not like they're getting away with menopause or they have fewer symptoms you have women with all kinds some women who have feel nothing others who feel everything so that's across the board that's very universal but when it's their attitudes it was more like well it's just a part of life like i'm not going to complain it's just the way it is and it's and it was kind of an attitude where I felt like you know, I've got so many other problems to to deal with. Like, this is not the one. I got to feed the family. I got to make a few few bucks and get on with my life. And so that's what I thought was really interesting. And when you ask them, well, what do you think is good advice for a woman going through this transition? It was very simple. It was lower your stress, try to chill out. It's going to be fine on the other side. Um, I wish I didn't worry as much. I wish, uh, I think you should exercise and you should eat healthily, whatever that means. For some women, it was like, I like to juice, or you should eat fruit, or you should not eat dairy, or whatever it is that that they thought was, was a healthy way of living. So they looked at diet and exercise, which is simple, and stress. So I think that was... That was a interesting advice and that we could definitely take on board. I think it's very, very helpful. But when you ask about hormone therapy, oh, no, 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 that's nothing. No, nobody would, very, very few women have actually taken it. I find that in 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 the, the reels on the interviews that I've done in Asia, it was more like, no, didn't do it, didn't think about it or wasn't offered or I don't really know. Whereas in the, in Europe, It's more, and I'm talking about France, Spain, uh, Poland, Latvia, these countries where I've done these interviews, it was more like when you ask them about hormone therapy, oh no, like I would never do that. That's bad for you. And that causes cancer. I did it naturally, the badge Mm -hmm. of honor. And that's that's a, a different attitude I found in, in Europe as opposed to Asia. And again, very few women, even in Europe, or are on HRT or know anything about it. It's just, it's bad. I'm not going to even look at it. So those were interesting things. Just 
Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, that is interesting. And my experience, though, like being in India this summer is Ayurvedic medicine is used. So they're using herbs and traditional medicine through the horm you know, menopausal transition to support the liver. It's all with liver support, right? Detox, mm -hmm. liver support, um, adaptogens incorporated. And then when I was in China and Thailand and where was I? Hong Kong. It was medicinal, medicinal foods right? There's the, you know, the, I don't know what you want to call it, type of apothecary, the herbal, apo I mean, I remember shark fins and I, mean, I don't know <laughs> what that was used for, like um, male cordyceps, vitality or mushroom, something. Mushroom, the cordyceps. Mushroom. Yeah. Right. So it's not hormones, but it's, it's food or herbs or, um, you know, traditional type of, uh, Yep. ingredients that were incorporated to help with balancing the hormones. So did you find women using those modalities? When they needed it? Yes, they were much more attractive. They would, they would talk about some herbs and I would try to write them down. I was like, what is this? Never even heard of it. But they would say, yeah, they, some of them had supplements, you know, maybe like primrose oil or something that we would know in the West. But yes, if they, if they relied on anything, so, uh, a type of medicine, quote unquote medicine, it would be Chinese medicine. And because I hadn't, I didn't interview as many Indian women um, and I haven't interviewed yet in India, but I would certainly bet that would be a, a part of their, of their, you know, hemenopausal, you know, trying to lower their symptoms. So for sure, yes, that was part. But even then it was almost as if they were, they didn't even want to admit that. Like they just, mm. they felt like they, they should, they should say, I, I just did it on my own or didn't need to go to a doctor or it, it was interesting. I'm not really sure why. Um, and again, we have to keep in perspective. They're speaking to a total stranger. They're being fit, filmed on this. So it's a, probably a certain type of woman who would even agree to this. So it's not going to be, this is not, you know, a study. This is not, this is just me on the street with certain women. So we have to take that into account. Yeah, I think it's so fascinating. So when I was in India this summer, one of the, you know, I was speaking to the at the American Center on PCOS. And so it was digging into some of the, you know, the um, Ayurvedic treatments for PCOS and talking about it. And, and, and I found that people do want to talk about it. They're like, okay, like I'll, I'm emerging, I'm getting my voice. I'm, you know, want to have these conversations because it's a real issue right now in India. And then I had a conversation with a woman postmenopause who's uh, an attorney, a corporate attorney, although she says had things been different between males and females when she was going through uh, law school, she'd have been a litigator. So it just wasn't a place for a woman as a litigator in India. And mm. she's probably one of the most brilliant women I've ever met and just so poised. And she was very fascinated to, she said, we don't talk about in India, we don't talk about menopause here. You're absolutely right. We don't talk about it. We don't address it. Um, you know, there's certain things that we can take from the Ayurveda, but when it comes to the going to the Western clinics, the um, the physicians, the medical clinics, that it's really not well addressed. And it's not, you know, I think that's piece of the issue is educating worldwide on, on hormonal therapies, but also educating worldwide on the traditional medicines, because, you know, these, the, the, integral part is all that liver support, detox support. And that's how our hormones are metabolized. And so, and also gut support, but definitely, definitely the liver support piece, which is under, you know, emphasized in all our hormone clinics in America, like very few and very select with, you know, with age management or functional medicine background are going to be talking about detox, liver detox, gut support, all of those important critical issues to, to health and then finding what, you know, what are some, you know, you said some people were saying, okay, juice or stop the dairy or, you know, I think the practices that associate with longevity, as you've been doing gerontology, some of the key hacks with longevity. And before we, you know, before we started talking, you mentioned methylene blue. I'm like, I just started methylene blue again in my, I go in phases with different things, but let's talk about methylene blue as a biohack. 
So I just also started Methylene Blue, and that's a little bit late for me as a biohacker because this has been in the biohacking space for a long time. But I just had a total hip replacement. I'm 54, and what? a lot of people are shocked. Yeah. Why? Yes. What happened? Osteoarthritis pulled me down. I tried to biomack my way out of it. <laughs> <laughs> in the end, I had nine of the risk factors and uh, nine out of 12 risk factors. Let's talk about that. those risk factors. Then we'll oh. come back to methylene blue, y'all. Oh, yes. So if I could, I can't remember all of them, but first of all is age. Well, I can't do anything about that. Second is being female. So that's your gender. Couldn't do anything about that. And then there's the genetic makeup and that, that has a big impact. And then maybe you had an injury. And that happened to me, uh, you know, an, an injury from a long time ago, right? So that some of this stuff just takes time to build up. Um, ha being athletic, that's me. Um, and then there is menopause. The loss of your hormones can accelerate some of this um, degradation, which is in a lot of if somebody doesn't know what osteoarthritis is. It's not osteoporosis. Osteoarthritis is um, an inflammation of the joints. And it can happen in your knees or for me, in my case, it was my hips. And then there is obesity, which I don't have, smoking, not me, and occupation, which was, you know, certain things that certainly wasn't me. And um, there were a few other ones and I can't exactly remember them, but the, those are the kinds of things I thought, well, well, I've got most of these and and it just happened. So I did have an injury and, and all that. So you, I did everything I could. It doesn't mean that everybody's doomed if you have osteoarthritis. His mind was just more advanced. And I think there's a lot of things. I had tried uh, over a, a hundred different things to try to mitigate the, the 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 situation and to avoid surgery. And I and I still would recommend a lot of them, even if they didn't work for me. I think they brought relief in many cases. And maybe somebody has the first stage osteoarthritis, they could they could actually get away with it without having to do surgery. And I've spent tens of thousands of dollars in the last several, I don't know, let's say nine years more or less is when I've been trying to hack this. And yeah, so I have a lot of knowledge and experience. So to get back to the methylene blue, I didn't do that. I kind of wish, could, there's a lot of things I thought, oh, I should have tried that. But you get to a point where you say, At, no more. I've run out of money and I run out of time and it's time for me to get a surgery. And I'm just so happy it's done. But methylene blue has been recommended to me because it reduces inflammation. And when you have a major surgery, that is really, really important. Of course, it helps with mitochondrial function. It helps with bring back energy. It helps um, with um, it's with the, it helps with the gut. It help, actually, it's one of those things that, um, oh, angiogenesis, that's another thing. It, you know, brings back more blood flow, the creation of more, more connections, more, more blood. Oh, you help me with this one. This one is the more yeah, circulation um, and, and immune system. The immune system. Yeah. But it's the, the angiogenesis is the, is the creation of new blood vessels. Sorry. That was just had a a moment. So yeah. And yeah, it's, there's a lot of things. It's one of those things that sounds like, oof, it's the cure-all for everything. Doesn't mean it will. <laughs> Everyone has a different, um, different reaction and different benefits from it. But if you look at some of the benefits, it's, that's what it is. And I can't remember what exactly it is, but it, it's something that's been around for a long, long time. It's nothing new. And, um, it's just when modern medicine came over, took over, we didn't, you know, we had drugs, we don't need methylene blue so much anymore. But it's one, it's a newer biohack for me that I'm just experimenting with. I haven't really used it with my clients. I haven't recommended it because I haven't really tried it myself and I am not as knowledgeable about it, but I'm learning more and more about it. It turns your tongue absolutely blue. So you're doing you a turkey then? Uh, no, I, in Europe, I can't, only in Spain, I couldn't get a hold of them. So I got the powder that you mix with water, like 100, okay. 100 ml water. You have this teeny tiny bit of powder. You mix it and you get these two two big vials of, of methylene blue. You, I do 20 drops and I'm going to be working up to, I think, 50 or 60 drops. And it depends on how many kilos you are and how much you take. So don't listen to me and go, oh, I'm going to take 20 drops. It depends yeah. on a lot of things. But it is interesting. So I, I will be using this probably for the next, I don't know, I'll, I'll see how I go for three months more or less and, yeah. and see how that works. How, why are you using it or trying so, it out? Well, I use it for patients, um, definitely for mitochondrial function, for energy, for long haul COVID, 
for immune support, Lyme disease, and you can definitely feel energy. Now, too much, too long can actually adversely affect the gut microbiome. And so there's caution there. It's not something you stay on long term. You've got to flush it out of your, you know, you've got to take alternatives. I prescribe it so it's in capsules so you don't get the blue. You do get the blue urine, very, yeah. very blue urine. And, and it does stay in the system because, you know, I've been playing with uh, methylene blue for a little while now, and then I had stopped it. But like a couple of weeks later, I did a fast and I started peeing blue again. So it's like, there's a storage <laughs> thing, a storage aspect to the methylene blue. So you really do want to kind of, um, I, I think flush it. And they're definitely much more educated people than me on this topic. So, but learning about its function in the mitochondria as a, as a gynecologist and a surgeon, we would inject methylene blue post hysterectomy to then do look inside the bladder to make sure, okay, we didn't hit the ureters. We would just mm -hmm. see the blue patient would do well, let them know they're going to blue urine, uh, have, you know, pee blue for a couple of days, but not to worry about it. So I didn't even know as a, as a surgeon, the mitochondrial benefits of methylene blue till in the biohacking place. And there are, you know, trochees that definitely do turn your tongue blue. If you're doing the liquid, drink it in a straw, but it is, um, I definitely like the capsules in a powdered form and also the dosage, you know, being really, um, particular about, the dosage and typically 25 milligrams a day to 25 milligrams twice a day. And in certain cases and, you know, but paying attention to how the patient's doing, sometimes mm -hmm. they can feel too hyper. Um, sometimes they can just feel this great mental clarity energy. And so it's just one of those things that I'll layer into, um, a, a person's protocol periodically. Can I, can I ask you something? Because since I've been going down this track, a couple of comments have been said to me when I post about methylene blue is somebody says, oh, it turns your brain blue. And I asked my biohacking besties who know a lot about methylene blue. They said, well, no, don't, don't you can ignore that. Because I was like, is this going to, should I go down this rabbit hole and start doing all the research and finding this, which I will. They said, don't bother. But I, I would love to know your, your opinion, if you knew anything about that and what that actually means. And I thought, well, maybe that's a good thing to have a bit of methylene blue in my brain. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Well, I, I think, I think so. I think so. But again, you got to flesh it, flesh it out. I have not heard that, that it turns the brain blue. It does stay in the tissue. And so hence the flushing after um, being on it for a while. I think that's really important. Um, yeah, no, um, it's really good for the brain. I haven't heard of any long-term significant consequences, not the way we've been using it and prescribing it in clinic, but I think it's definitely something to be cautious of seeing how you do. But in clients with um, cognitive decline, methylene blue can really help with cognition and focus. Clients with ADHD, it can help with um, cognition. Now, the thing is, cannot like in the reproductive age groups, you have to be really, really careful if pregnancy is a risk factor. And that is contraindicated in pregnancy. So mm -hmm. that's good to know. That's good to know. Not my community. Usually they're, <laughs> they're past, they're past mm -hmm. the, the pregnancy phase, but it is really good to know because anyone listening to this will, will may, may jump on it. And again, I, I, Tell people, don't just go and buy this on Amazon and experiment with yourself. Get the guidance from somebody who knows what they're doing. You particularly would be a good person to do this with. There's another interesting one that I've been trying out is BPC-157, the peptide. Have you worked with that at all? Yeah, I wrote about it in, in my first book, The Hormone Fix, and then in Keto Green 16. And so mm -hmm. in the, you know, I mean, I, I think that really does help orally with gut support, injection with immune support, with aging longevity. And again, it's one of those things um, that, you know, gets cycled in and cycled out of. Yeah, I think it's, it, it's anyone who has gut issues raves about it. And mm -hmm. we're talking about injectables. They say, I think the research has been showing that the supplements actually for gut issues are, are showing pretty good head to head with the injectables. Cause generally yeah. we say, well, injectable, you'll have a better, faster effect. But I, in my experience, I've spoken just, you know, to a few people in my community and they seem to have the preference still for the injectables. And maybe it depends on what kind of gut issues you have, but 
anyone who's got gut issues, I tell them just go and start looking at BPC-157 and because it, it seems very, very powerful. Yeah. I, and I I'm taking like, it for the inflammation and, and actually to, I have on so much medicine and antibiotics and everything that the, the doctors have been giving me. I wanted to protect the gut, but also to lower the inflammation. It was supposed to be very good for that. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the risk factor of inflammation being the number one issue with aging, right? Mm -hmm. Inflammation rapidly causes us to age. And so I'm curious, circling back to the osteoarthritis, do you have any bone loss, osteopenia? Was that part of the? Um... No, I, my hip have, I just was diagnosed with osteopenia of the spine, which to me is no surprise, but the hips, the bones of the hips are strong. They're dense. They're in the green. And so that was, it's, it's totally different. And the spine, and I thought, oh, that's the first time someone ever told me I had osteopenia, but for two years, I have not been able to do any impact exercises. I just started hormone therapy a couple of years before that, but on very baby dosages. And I didn't know as much of how at that time, like, oh, I need probably more robust, um, um, uh, more robust dosages of, of hormones. So when I put the pieces together, I thought, okay, no impact. Uh, hormones are low and there's no surprise, but that we can reverse. So I'm, I, I'm happy to get my hips back and I'll be able to do everything, optimizing my hormones. And I expect that curve to, to change and among many other things as well. I take su supplements as well. So I think that that'll help. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's key. And uh, have you done some peptides or injectable peptides in the joints before the surgery? I've done PRP, platelet rich plasma, which is they take blood from your, your arm, let's say spin in a centrifuge 15 minutes later, they re inject it into the hip. And I've also had my knee because I had knee issues. I, I tore my ACL when I was in my 20s. So I've been doing PRP for a long time. And that was the one thing, if I had to choose one thing that helped me with the osteoarthritis, it was that, and yeah. that worked it. I would bounce back. Cause this has been like nine years more or less. It's only the last couple of years. I, I just couldn't hack it anymore. PRP just wasn't doing it anymore, mm -hmm. but usually I'd have a good year and a half bouncing back and I could do whatever I wanted to do. So I would recommend looking into PRP. Uh, but I think there's a lot of, when I asked the doctor, why is it in my research, I find that only 50 to 80% of the people have some results. And he says, well, one, you need good blood, right? <laughs> and that's, if you have don't have a healthy diet and if you don't have a healthy lifestyle, your blood is no good because you're re-injecting that stuff. So it better have, have an effect. And so the other thing he said, well, you need a good doctor, obviously who knows what they're doing. And so that's the, you know, his two, two takes on it. But I do think it's worth a try knowing that maybe it won't work. That's why insurance doesn't pay for this because it's one big experiment. But for me, it really, really works. That I did injectable. The other thing that I think is really worth talking about, if anybody's thinking of, on that track of osteoarthritis, that's pentacin polysulfate. And I had experienced. Uh, I was working with um, Dr. Yorth from the Boulder, Boulder Longevity Institute, and she is all about regenerative medicine. And she said, let's take this. It's a drug. It's originally used in racehorses, <laughs> bring it back to life. But now the human trials are showing, showing great promise. And in, with her clients, it was about 80% of the people could reverse, like reverse osteoarthritis. No one ever told me I could do that. Even the PRP says, we're not reversing this. I was like, really? So I tried that for good year and it didn't work but what i was the drug again what was it was it injectable or oral it's, it's an injectable you inject it a couple times a, a week twice a week sometimes once a week you know we tried different different modules and it's uh it's a drug so you need a doctor to guide you through this and it's called Zilosul is the brand name i think and uh but it is the drug is called pentacin polysulfate and I really think it, 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 when you read the research and you, she, she threw me through on me all the studies and I was just blown away and actually has anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, anti-cancer, like all this stuff. You think there's no way. I said, okay, even if it doesn't work, it's probably good for me anyways. Right, right. But it is something to look into. And if it's true that you have 80% of well, at least her clients were um, having results, it's worth a shot. It just wasn't with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then were there early um, signs like in your blood work about the osteoarthritis? Were you getting a high CRP? Any 
Nope. Not even until the day before the surgery, my CS HS CRP was very low. And I thought, how is it even possible? I know there's inflammation there. I can feel it, but it wasn't detecting it. Mm. And that's the only, pla- I mean, it's funny because you look, you know, all my, my I, all my health, health uh, markers, markers are, are really great. I, I sleep like a baby, oddly enough, because usually people with osteoarthritis can't. I, I feel great. I have energy. I don't feel any different. Body composition is the same. All the, the blood work is the same as if, you know, over the years and years, despite the hormones going down. And think it's just very localized, just in this one place. And I probably bought myself time. It was eventually going to happen, but with all the biohacking that I was doing, all right, maybe I delayed the surgery by several years because I was doing every anti-inflammatory diet, doing the rehab exercises, doing everything that you know you should be doing, managing the stress. Um, I was doing the inner work. I was like, okay, I've finished looking at outward people trying to help me. I'm going to look inward. I did a lot of journaling, a lot of meditation, did the Joe Dispenso, went to his retreat. I, I did everything hoping and I thought, maybe there's trauma in there. I don't know about <laughs> bring it all out. And uh, it still was a great experience, but it didn't reverse it. But it's still worth a try. Again, I wouldn't knock it. I just try it. You never yeah, know. And a yeah, lot of again, things- you don't know how long you extended that, right? And then also just working on continuing to decrease inflammation in your body so it doesn't show up somewhere else. Yeah, that was a good question you had. I'm glad you asked it because that always just baffled me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can look for those experiences. And, and you know, one of the things like one of the reasons I tell clients, I want if I'm going to treat you prescribe for you, I want to see you in person, and do a head to toe exam executive physical and I say the body always has something to share right? Mm -hmm. What's not on the, that's not on the lab test. That's not in the history. The body always has something to share. And, and so it's, and and a lot of times we're dealing with a symptom or experience and and we don't see it or feel it or even notice it anymore, but it's something that you can pick up. And it can be in the gait, the walk, the way you're standing. It can be in skin symptoms, it can be in temperature symptoms and different parts of the body. And of course, the hormonal changes that can occur. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating to me, the what the body can share. And I would say I learned to become a good clinician, because when I was a medical student, I, um, I did a uh, summer in Egypt at the University of Alexandria and the hospital system there with I worked with their doctors, and they were amazing wow. clinicians in Egypt. I mean, like, you know, they didn't have a book and then, you know, this is 1990. So um a Palm Pilot, other things like that, that some of us in, in the U.S. had, but they is they had the books in the library. They memorized everything. They had they could see someone walk in the door and tell you exactly what they have and what the labs will show and, and what the tests that they can't order, you know, what the x-rays would show. And so wow. it really was fascinating from the conjunctiva of the eye to the shape of the tongue, to the color of the skin, to the, you know, any areas of swelling on the body. I mean, it was really fascinating to me. And I think like that is um, an important part of, of, of getting to know ourselves. Like you say, hack my age is getting to know what your body's telling you, listening in and, and doing that exploration. And it's always like, there's always something coming up in mind. That's like, okay, <laughs> You got to learn this now. It's amazing. I'm fascinated with this tour that you did in Egypt and they don't teach you in medical school. I'm assuming how to read the body or do they? Well, I went to an osteopathic medical school. So we really Mm -hmm. were in tuned with that from Mm -hmm. craniosacral therapy to alignment. Alignment is everything. And fascia is everything. Fascia connects all throughout our body. It holds us together. So reading temperature changes, focusing on alignment, a lot of us post, um, you know, osteopathic medical school move away from it, but understanding that importance, like for me, osteopathic manipulation, especially for pelvic pain, postpartum, prepartum, you know, was an important part of practice. And then being able at least to identify when I need to refer out to osteopathic care or chiropractic care, but Mm -hmm. how the body's all connected. And yeah. that is, that was a really important part of our training. Mm. What was the big takeaway from Egypt? 
Oh my gosh, so many takeaways, so many takeaways and really recognizing how that, I think that, that clinical, like there's no lab test, no x-ray that when someone is so skilled clinically that, you know, that is, is just able to share and read. And I think there's something to like intuitive medicine, um, practitioners that are able to read the energy coming off your body because we are energetic beings. And then, again, of course, like I rely on high tech too. I like, I love people to get the Pranuva full body MRI. I love that procedure to be able to see what's you know, early, what could be forming or a possible problem or an area to focus intent concentration on. But I think that the one thing was just how ancient medicine is and mm. to really honor the body's signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. Something we need to really pay attention to in this menopause transition, right? Because mm -hmm. we Which... want to deny it. Yeah. And I find actually on the interviews I do around the world, so often I meet women who say, oh, no, 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 I didn't go through menopause. And I said, well, how old are you? 60. Do you still have your period? No. Nope. I said, well, you did. But what they're referring to is that they didn't have any of the, the typical signs and symptoms that they're expecting. And that's usually only three. And I don't know if you've interviewed Andrea Donsky, but she did some great research on she came up with 103 symptoms of menopause. So when I speak to them off camera, because when I interview, I do not interfere. I do not say, I just let them speak. But off camera, I'm like, did you know, <laughs> how are your bones or how are, how are things going internally? And, and you find out, yeah, they're having a lot of issues, but it's really crucial that women know what are some of the symptoms of menopause that maybe they're not associating to sort of a phantom smell, for example, even though it's not, um, it's not a, it's not going to change anything. It's not horrible. It's not breaking down the brain or something. As far as I know, it's, it's some of these things that they give you clues that yes, I am going now through this perimenopause transition, but the, 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 um, the anxiety, uh, stress, a lot of women are depressed and they think there's something wrong with them when perhaps it could be just their hormones are taking, going out the door. And then there's the silent killers like osteoporosis or there's heart disease. And we don't notice those. We don't feel osteoporosis happening. So the awareness is really, really important. And then to, to check, I mean, I'm a biohacker. We love to test, measure, and assess when we do some kind of an experiment, but we need to know our own bodies. And, and like you said, dialing in and knowing what is normal for us, what's not normal for us, but it's great to have some of the the checks of modern medicine of, of uh, maybe a DEXA scan or understanding your, your cardiovascular uh, blood work and understanding what risks do you have? And then you can mitigate some of these things. So you can, important. And yeah. even genetics, you know, like, you know, and then layering it with epigenetics. Zora, mm. so what are some of your, as we close, share with us some of your favorite biohacks that you personally are like, like, I'm going to do this every day mm. for as long as possible. Well, there's, I'll just talk about a couple of my favorites. One is breath work. It's free. We need to know how to breathe. I've done the breathwork certification with the oxygen advantage. It's a type of one type of breathing, functional breathing, but I think there's many types just learn how to breathe. And I know it sounds weird. Like we forgot how to breathe. Yes. We have become over breathers. Yes. You can over breathe. <laughs> you can. And, and that's because when we are living in this high, high stressed state or our modern world, there's a lot of things that are happening. We don't realize we become upper chest breathers. We breathe through our mouth. We're breathing too heavily. And this is all from, from the stress that we have. So when we have to learn how to breathe, meaning breathing through our nose, keeping the mouth shut. <laughs> and this is functional breathing. I'm not saying if your yoga teacher tells you to breathe out through the nose or the mouth, that's fine. I'm just saying on the day-to-day -day basis, when you sleep, even when you exercise, 
try to keep the mouth closed. And that keeps the, the ner autonomic nervous system much more calm. It, it, it touches the vagus nerve and tells which is the main nerve down the whole from the brain all the way down to your body to all the other organs and telling it to relax. And so we want to be able to affect that in a, in a positive way. We have a be better buildup of nitric oxide, which is a, a vasodilator, opens up the blood vessels and we have more blood flow. A lot of things can happen. We start to become CO2 tolerant, meaning we when we we have uh, uh, we're able to oxygenate the blood more because we're in this relaxed state and hemoglobin that carries 98% of our oxygen is able to release that tight bond that it usually has with oxygen when we're in this relaxed state and when we're breathing low and light. And that means we're able to also become more diaphragmatic breathers, breathing through the lower part of the body. Because there's a lot of this chemical exchange that happens when we're able to get the air down and deeper into the lungs. So there's a lot of cool stuff that can happen. It's, a, it's an awesome biohack that's helpful for women going through menopause when we are more anxious and when we're more moody or more stressed out, we're feeling overwhelmed, we cannot sleep. Some of these typical symptoms we can we can relax we can mitigate them with our breath we don't need a drug we don't need an app we don't need some fancy you know biohacking tool we just need to learn how to breathe so there's so many great youtube videos you can find this on there are apps that you can use like um a headspace or i mean that's headspace or so if you have an aura ring some of these these gadgets we do have have some built-in breath work and um insight timer is probably one of my favorite um I, i'm not sponsored by any of these things I just think they're really cool tools breathe breath work is one of my favorite favorite hacks and i'm going to tell you the that. next one yeah yes i love that Yep. Ready for the next I'm one? Sitting here breathing deep as you talk as you're talking. Yes. What's next? Yeah. Yes. So okay. The next one I have it a lot of people don't know about, and I think it's been the greatest tool for me, is katsu training, K double A T S U. And this is these are it's it's a type of blood flow restriction. And if you Google even PubMed blood flow restriction, there's thousands of studies on it. And when you, and I'm using this for body composition because I am not able to do impact exercises for two years. So I was really worried uh, my muscle mass is just going to go to mush. Uh, I'm not going to lose all my strength and what's going to happen to me. So Katsu came in my life just about that time. And I've been using them every day and I've been able to preserve my muscle mass all the way up into the surgery. And I continue to do it now. And what blood flow restriction does is you have these bands on your arms or your legs and you partially restrict the blood flow going through the extremity. And what happens there is in when it does this, it, it activates growth hormone, it tells the pituitary gland, let's release the growth hormone. And so you have hypertrophy and hypertrophy is basically increasing the muscle mass. And so when women are struggling with menopause weight gain and they're trying everything and I'm not saying replace exercise whatsoever um I think this is a great tool to enhance perhaps the training that you're already doing and if you google this or you youtube uh katsu or blood flow restriction you find two camps you find the bodybuilders who want to get more gains and then you find the rehab people who are dealing with people who are injured who are sick who just had surgery and as a gerontologist when I found this out I was like why aren't we talking about right. blood flow restriction? No, this is good stuff. <laughs> it's great. It's amazing. The, the difference is that if anyone listening is like, oh, I want to go into this blood flow restriction, you can buy these bands on Amazon. They're really cheap. I don't recommend to do that because you are restricting some blood flow. So they're contraindications. If you have any kind of heart uh, issues, you should not be doing this or you should be asking a doctor. There are other ones that are a bit more sophisticated where you have this um, little gauge and you have a pump that looks like the blood pressure pump. You're, you're pushing it, increasing the pressure and that's it. And it stays there. And, it, and, and usually it starts to hurt after 10 minutes and you lift a baby weight and you're like, it feels like you're lifting a truck. So it, that's why it's it's great for me as a nomad because I thought, well, great, you know, I'm not going to carry weights. I can't go to a gym. So I carry these bands around with me. And, but that also has contraindications. The, the next level is the katsu bands. And that has an increases the pressure for 
30 seconds, then, de then decreases the pressure. All the air goes out for five seconds. So this is cycling thing. That's the magic. And this is nothing new. This is invented in Japan in the 1960s for cardiac rehab patients who were losing their muscle. And so I feel perfectly safe um, recommending katsu because they're, they're very, very, um, they're, they're fewer contraindications, let's say. And the problem is, is that they're very expensive, relatively speaking. So it's, it's been like that. I, I choose, you know, choose your weapon. You can take either way. I do recommend people to explore this. I think it's fantastic for preserving your muscle mass or even increasing it. And I actually did increase my muscle mass, believe it or not, with, no impact exercises, doing a fraction of what I used to do. And first I thought it was me, maybe I'm some anomaly. I slowly started to talk about it, tell some friends, they started using it. They gave me good feedback. And then I, I started talking about it with my community. People were buying this. And I was like, if you buy this, you got to tell me, I need, I need the yeah, feedback. How are you doing? Right. Everybody's loving it. So i that's why I get enthusiastic about it. Cause I'm like, okay, it's not just me. It's really, well, really works. And the top athletes, right, and performance centers and many gyms have the compression sleeves, right? So their yeah. leg, their arm, their, there's the, the compression sleeve. So they compress and then expand, compress, yeah. and they can do it sequentially. So, you know, maybe oh, if you yeah. check in, maybe your gym has it. Yeah. It's a, it's in very, very effective, let's say. Yeah, and, now and I got to use it more. Like I, I don't think I've used it once in the last year. I've got <laughs> oh, reminders, please. right? So many pieces. All right. Yes. What else? What's another favorite? Um, so the other favorite hack is for women, and I'm talking about men and women going through menopause. And one of the most effective ones is, is hormone therapy. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is something that I think too few women are aware of and that it is perfectly safe. Estrogen doesn't cause cancer. You know, there's, I, I encourage women to read up on it. Obviously talk to your doctor about the risks versus the benefits of taking hormone therapy, but also please ask your doctor about the risks and benefits of not taking it. What's going to happen if I don't? I mean, it's a perfectly valid question, but it is, it's just so effective. And I've seen women's lives absolutely change because I can tell them, you know, clean up your diet, go and exercise, get the sleep going, you know, prioritize that and, and, and manage the stress. And, and when you're dealing with hot flashes and mood swings, anxiety, um, at, at hot at night sweats, you can't sleep. And then you don't sleep well, and you're too tired and you can't go to the gym and it's just, they're trying their best and it's still cannot get the results they want, but with a little bit of progesterone or maybe a little bit of estrogen with the progesterone, then that helps them sleep better. And then they wake up with more energy and yes, they feel like going to the gym. And now that they're exercising, they feel like cooking a healthy meal. So it all just kind of spirals in, in a, in a very positive way. So I would say, please educate yourself on hormone therapy and have that discussion with your doctor. Don't just poo poo it and say, no, it's not for me. It's, it's, it's bad. Yeah. It, yeah. And I definitely have a lot of resources on my website too, for hormones, progesterone, DHEA. And one of our things is the menopause kit, which is the combination of superfoods, the adaptogens and Mighty Maca Plus, the balance cream, which has progesterone, pregnenolone and tripeptide and the Jolva, which has DHEA and plant stem cells. So there's, and again, transdermally is the safest way. So being able to work from the inside out and the outside in really has been game changing. It's like, this is my foundations of my, of my life and of my recommendations for sure. So where are oh. you off to next, Zora? And how can um, people find you? Before I answer that, I would love to mention as well, the Mighty, Ma Mighty Maca is, is one of those things. You just reminded me, I did have, I did have a chance to try your Mighty Maca and definitely, and I gave some of them to, to my friends and they all reported great. They all feel good. It tasted awesome. And, and they gave them more energy. So that, and of course the Jolva, I hear a lot of stuff, but a lot of great, great information about that. It's good feedback. So just to give you a little bit of feedback in my community, people are really liking the Jolva too. So um, thank you. Can't forget that about that. Thank <laughs> you. So where can we find me on hackmyage.com? That's all my, my website and you can find me on Twitter and uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, everywhere, always hack my age. And if you can't remember that Zora, the Explorer, you'll find me as well because you can remember <laughs> Dora and just put a Z there and, and you'll find me. 
That is awesome. Any plans to come back to the U.S. anytime soon? Not anytime soon. I may have to do the second hip. So I want to think if I can get that done <laughs> in, in the near future. But no, I, I, I think I got to take care of these two and then I'll be on my way. Yeah, yeah, it sounds good. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your expertise and your research. I think this is, you know, there's always so much to learn. I'm always learning like, okay, and then I forget about, oh, yeah, there's that, right, that piece. But there's only so much we can do in a day, right? The daily disciplines that we make and take and incorporate into our life are really key, getting into the habit of doing it, making that like, you know, how do I optimize my life checklist? What serves me? What doesn't serve me? And making room. Sometimes it's just making room for ourselves. Like you said, making space, making that space or time for that deep breath work and, um, and, and focusing on that, paying attention to how we're breathing, how deep we're breathing. Is it belly breath? Is it upper, you know, and are we really breathing through our nose. Like I'm definitely, you know, I was easy to be a scuba diver because I was a mouth breather. So even mm -hmm. like, you know, mouth tape at night to help with deep restorative sleep can make a really big difference. So yeah. a big thanks to Zora for being on our girlfriend doctor podcast today and sharing her biohacks and also just like the experience around the world. There's always so much to learn. So I look forward to um, you guys check her out. Hack my age, Instagram, on the wet, her website and everywhere on social media, be sure to follow because who knows what she's up to next. <laughs> I want to know your hacks. What works for you? What are something that you want to try? What are you curious about? What do you want me to podcast about? Go deeper into methylene blue, go deeper into hormones. I, you know, sometimes I think I'm always talking hormones, but you know, I want to talk about other things, but I definitely want to make sure that I'm serving you. So do all the things like subscribe, share this podcast with your friends, and then let me know. You can email us at team at drannacabeca.com or just comment below this podcast. Be sure you're subscribed on YouTube because we'll be doing some live series coming up and I want to make sure you don't miss it. So look forward to seeing you next time on the Girlfriend Doctor Show. Thanks for watching another episode of the Girlfriend Doctor podcast. Check out all the links below for more.